Welcome back to Bumblebee. Here are the top 10 normal things from history too woke for this era. Before we dive into that list today though guys, I just wanted to take a quick second to shout out today's video sponsor. Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a new Unreal subscription streaming service that offers an unparalleled amount of documentaries and non-fiction work that includes originals that are exclusive to the platform, which of course means that you won't be able to find them anywhere else. I have a lot of subscriptions to streaming services, but Curiosity is by far the cheapest with the same and even better levels of content. It's so affordable, it's under $20 a year. It's only $167 a month. That's less than a bus ride in Toronto. That's less than a coffee in Toronto, and you already know just looking at me that I'm getting those extra larges, of course. Not only is it accessible because of the cost, but it's available on so many platforms as well. From the web, app, Roku, Android, Xbox One, smart TVs, iOS, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, you name it. Really however you prefer to watch, Curiosity Stream is right there. I recently watched Zenith Adventures in Space Exploration, which is a docu-series that was so captivating and it was so aesthetically pleasing as well that I binged the entire thing in one day. And every week they add new titles, so there's always something new to discover. If you guys head to curiositystream.com slash bumblebee or just hit the link down below, it's a little bit easier, in the description, you can get access to all these unbelievable titles. And if you use code bumblebee at the checkout, you will save 25% on your membership, which will then come out to $4.99 for the entire year. That's $1.25 a month. I pay more for Netflix in one month than I do for Curiosity Stream for the entire year. It doesn't take a genius to figure it out. Don't miss out on the limited time offer and get to streaming. Enjoy. Now let's dive right back into this list. Number 10, New Year's Traditions. Looking over to Lancastrian folklore back in 1872, there was a New Year's tradition. I figured since it's close to that time of the year, I might as well throw it in, kick off the list. To celebrate another lap around the sun, your fortune was also revealed. What a lovely combo. If you want to know what kind of partner you're going to end up marrying, well, this superstition might help. It tells you to pour some molten lead into a glass of water and whatever form those drops assume in the glass, that's going to hint towards your future partner's occupation. So if you see something resembling scissors or whatever, you might just end up marrying a tailor. I mean the profession, not, not this. Now, of course, it was never clear what it meant if it was a blob. Of course, a lot of the time, the shape was whatever you just wanted it to be. That was the whole fun of it. But obviously now, we don't recommend pouring molten lead anywhere in the house. Just champagne. Number nine, daylight motion pictures. When the lights dim right before a movie starts, I get so pumped. I don't just mute my phone, I turn that thing off. Hell, sometimes I'll leave it in the car. I don't want anything to do with it. Movie theaters are an event. I don't care if we have seats ahead of time also, we're showing up early. That's just how it is. Daylight motion pictures were a thing back in the 1910s. It was basically a movie theater where the lights are all the way up the entire time. I have a hard enough time watching an after credit scene while people are moving around, let alone an entire movie while the room is fully illuminated. It's like watching a movie like this, surrounded by lights. I can barely do this, let alone watch a movie. That's crazy. But back then, people hated dark auditoriums for many reasons. They did this as well to avoid eye fatigue. That's what happens when your movie is so boring, you just fall asleep. This trend moved across the country and a bill was later passed so theaters had to be sufficiently lit, lit enough so that you can at least see who's next to you. And next up, there were complaints about movie quality, but at that point, historically, women were starting to feel safe enough to sit in dark theaters, so thankfully, they were allowed to dim the lights after. I'm glad they didn't stick around though. I can't even have a lamp on when I watch a movie, let alone all the lights. Number eight, the arrow remover. Ah, yes, finally, just the thing that I need to remove this arrow from my knee. It's about damn time. This device will surely solve that problem. That problem back in the 1500s, I mean. Patients back then were more often than not walking in with an arrow sticking out of them, either their chest, their arm, their back, anything horrible. Now, instead of cutting the tip off and then pulling it out the opposite way, the arrow remover would just cut into the injury furthermore, then open it even wider. Then it would hold it open, and then at that point, you would pull the entire arrow with the head back out through your leg or chest or whatever happened. They would open it up and pull it out instead of just snipping it and doing that. Sounds awful, right? Yeah, let's never do that again. Number seven, electrified water. Never put anything electric near water. I'm just gonna start by saying that right off the bat. If you didn't know that, here you go. Thumbs up for knowledge. Health and safety McWaters, let's do it. Just doing my part. In the early 1900s, electrified water was said to help cure hangovers. If you dipped your hands in it, of course. You don't drink it, you just gotta. And then all of a sudden, you're hydrated, somehow. If anything, this was just a waste of time and money. The chart stopped well before you'd come in contact with it, and also it didn't wash your clothes without soap. That was also a big rumor with electrified water. It would just somehow wash your clothes and get those stains out. Magic. I'd say we're getting better as a community, but considering gamers are selling bath water online, I, I don't know. It kinda feels like we're going backwards, really. We'll see. Number six, dangerous toys. You'll shoot your eye out, kid. We've all heard that one. Historically, toys have been pretty bad. I mean, moon shoes? 
Sorry, what? Remember those? You couldn't jump into a treehouse easily. You just rolled your ankle trying to get down the porch steps. It wasn't fun at all. It was just nonsense. Also, way too expensive. But nothing was as bad in history as the Gilbert U-238 Atomic Energy Lab toy set. Yeah, that even sounds horrible, you know what I mean? Upon first glance, it looks interesting, I guess, but when the company released this kit back in 1950, it was all but games. Gilbert, who is a successful toy maker, businessman, even magician, believed that his line of work should be fun yet informative. He was nicknamed the man who saved Christmas after he convinced the US Council of National Defense to not ban toy purchases during World War I. He was a big deal, and so was this toy. The main reason that it had been discontinued down the road, believe it or not, was because they were too expensive. This set was around $50, which back in the day was a lot more. The price was justified as the set was actually radioactive. The Atomic Energy Lab contained this cloud chamber where you can actually see alpha particles traveling at 12,000 miles a second. Imagine asking for a light break and then you open this up. And you're like, sorry, what? I can't even read this. What is this? Number five, elephant in the room. Execution by elephant is described as, well, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's loud, it's fast, and it sucks. This method of capital punishment is one of the worst because it involves elephants. And you know, those peanut eaters, they sadly never forget anything. It's a lot of trauma. The elephants would be used, as you would imagine, to crush, dismember, or just injure the victim in any way. The method was most commonly used by royalty because it was a way they could use elephants to signify both the power of the ruler as well as their ability to control a wild animal. His practice began to die out, luckily, in the 18th and 19th century, as parts of the world that used this method began to be colonized. Elephants were the chosen animal in this situation because, well, obviously, size matters when picking an animal to inflict pain, but also because of their intelligence. I mean, sure, bears and lions were popular in other parts of the world, so they did some damage too, don't get me wrong, but elephants would be trained to execute the person in a variety of different ways because they're so smart. This is all bad. To think this was normal stuff once, it's horrible. Number four, artificial leeches. What if you don't have a plethora of leeches to choose from? What if you need to let some blood out, but you don't have a barrel full of leeches? Now what are we supposed to do? Well, back in the 1800s, this metal cylinder with blades came to save the day. This was the solution. Yeah, the rotating blades dug into your skin while the metal cylinder sucked your blood out. It's kind of like a pepper shaker, only absolutely horrible. I would say when right away. I'd be like, please stop. Just stop doing that. I'm good. Bring me a thousand leeches instead. I'll take that any day over this saw contraption. Number three, amputation saw. When thinking back to some of these early methods of removing something from the body, it got pretty ugly most of the time. Amputation saws were a tool that doctors would take pride in. These looked like they were from the movie Saw. They were like decorative, they had swirls, these lovely grooves, dare I say, which in hindsight didn't help with germs at all. The last thing I want is a place for them to hide. And secondly, imagine you have to get something amputated and the doctor pulls out the family heirloom amputation saw. Little inappropriate. I love the teal and steel combo, but I'm gonna go to sleep now, thanks. Number two, syringes. You're probably thinking, wait a minute, Taylor, we still use syringes today. We don't want to leave that in the past. What, what are you talking about? How is this on the list? Syringes used to be massive, comedically large. I can't do needles or like tattoos as a 27 year old, let alone one of these things. No, I'm sorry, I'm good, I fold. In the 1500s, these were used to inject mercury as a treatment for syphilis. It was highly contracted at that point by sailors. And if needles aren't your thing, well, fear not. These actually wouldn't be injected into your skin at all. No, instead, it was much worse. The syringe was a urethral one, so it went into the tip of your... Yeah, you know what I mean? It wasn't pleasant. Sadly, the mercury would take out the subject before syphilis did, so this was all bad. We'll leave this in the past. And finally, coming in at number one, mummification. Once a normal everyday thing, kind of, mummification was quite advanced. Back in the 1300s, mummification was common, and even today we're continuing to find even more mummies. We're uncovering more ancient history by the decade. It's fascinating, but the more we think about it, the more we ask, how the hell was it done? And how the hell was it done so well? Well, we don't do it today because it takes a long, long time. And now, thankfully, we have cleaner methods to rest the dead. It wasn't cheap back then either. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's pretty brutal, but what you would do is you'd put a hook up your nose after you were dead, of course, and you would pull all of your brains out. Sounds awful, we're just beginning. After that, they would then cut the left side of the stomach, remove all those goods. Organs, everything in ya, just gone, right out. The timely process here is letting those organs dry. And while that's happening, you'd be gathering your finest mason jars for your lungs and the liver, of course. And then you put the heart back in the body after washing the insides out with wine and spices. Then you'd cover the body in salt for 70 days and then wrap them in bandages. Then the sarcophagus awaits. Now the jars of organs were also stored in the burial chamber at the end of the day, just for fun. 
Yeah, funerals are a bit easier now. We don't have, you know, jars of people's organs lying around. Now we just have flowers. I don't know. I kind of want to go back to the old ways. I just walk in and it's just a jar of my liver. They're like, hey, here's the photos of him. Check out his spleen. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today on Bumblebee. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters, and we'll see you next time. Peace.